the one that got away. Action! Now then, hello there, again. And today we're going to talk about an interesting story, another story about a Luftwaffe pilot from World War II. <coughs> This chap is a bit different though, a bit of a bit of a character, to put it mildly. <clears throat> we have a, a model to do a review on as well, the, uh, the gentleman's aircraft, um, but in some respects, for many people, he needs little introduction. Uh, this is the man who became known as the one that got away. Uh, and Luftwaffe Leutnant in the, um, uh, the Luftwaffe in northern France in 1940. Um, he joined the Luftwaffe in 1936 and became almost, almost the time he was actually shot down, he was becoming an ace. He got 12 victories already and basically he got into, um, he had, um, I've just got some detail in front of me actually, funnily enough with some background that I hadn't seen before but I've just seen the film, The One That Got Away and of course it's played by Hardy Kruger in the film uh, very expertly, a great actor, <laughs> and uh, certainly captures, I think, the attitude of the man, uh, from what I've read, very well. Um, and basically what happened is that this guy was in the Battle of Britain fighting for the Luftwaffe and got shot down. There's, there's a few stories around about this, but um, he'd already made some rather, um, shall we say, unusual claims. He claims to have shot nine hurricanes down in, in one in incident, and there were rumours that he claimed to have shot five of them down by pretending to be on the tail uh, as if he was one of the hurricanes and shooting them down as they came into land. Uh, this is disputed and it's disputed in the movie as well, uh, interestingly. So uh, there is some uh, feeling that even amongst the German side that maybe he exaggerated things slightly. Anyway, he was an ace pilot and he was very good at uh, what he did. Um, however misguided the, uh, uh, the leadership of his side were. Uh, anyway, um, he was basically shot down in a place called near Marden in Kent and a Spitfire uh, gunned him down and he managed to, uh, to pancake it, uh, belly land the plane in a field and was immediately arrested on the spot by home guard and uh, some local uh, passers-by. And he was then taken for interrogation in, uh, in London. Um, he uh, was very keen, as you see in the film, uh, which I strongly recommend you watch. Um, he wanted to be put in a prison camp because he was absolutely determined to escape and get back to Germany, which of course was almost close to impossible. Uh, very difficult to do that, um, but it, this guy was a very, very unusual character. He uh, was a very good English speaker, which made him unusual. and. He'd already been in several scrapes, I think he'd been in the Spanish Civil War briefly, and uh, he, knew, he knew his craft. But anyway, he was now out of the war in, in to all intents and purposes, and after some interrogation, uh, he was already quite well known because of these claims he'd made, which were clearly a little bit unusual. <laughs> and so he had a slight notoriety, and the British intelligence knew quite a lot about him. Anyway, ultimately he was transferred to prison camp, uh, as seemed to be his wish and they moved him to the uh, Grisdale Hall prison camp at Grisdale in the Lake District which is between Windermere and Coniston in that central valley. Um, and it's very interesting to point out, I'm going to just talk about Grisdale Hall for a moment because you see it in the movie and in fact uh, the hall, uh, when they filmed it in the, uh, in the movie, it was filmed on location but sadly they, a few, two or three years later it was demolished completely. Uh, I'm just going to show you some shots from Google Earth here. Um, I can try and avoid getting any reflections on it. Let's try that. There we go. Uh, this is actually um, the Google Earth image of Grisdale as it is today with the Go Ape and the Grisdale Centre that people visit on their holidays in the lakes. Um, and it's, it's over here on the other side of the road, the eastern side, that uh, I'm going to zoom you in, um, that basically uh, was the home of the prison camp. And just get the zoomer to come nice and close. That's about as far as it wants to go, I think. Um, or is it? Let's see if I can just encourage it a bit more, I think. There we go. How's that? Right, so now you see what I'm talking about. So, uh, over here, uh, this, this wall here, which I'll show you on the, 
easy to look at it if we look at it on street view like so Street U. Of course Street U doesn't want to play ball as we are live. Typical, isn't it? So let's go back to the Street View. There we go. That's the way. That's now we're getting there. We just spin around. And here. Now this this odd looking uh, structure here. This is called the Yan or the One Cumbrian dialect. Uh, this is a very new building, been put up about three or four years ago. Um, and it is actually on the site, where the actual location of that building is the actual site of the original Grisdale Hall. And if we just move down the road just a few metres, we can actually see here, whoops, and it's wanting to be silly, we can actually see this balustraded wall. Now this balustraded wall, if you watch the movie, is clearly at the front, like the gardens, it's around the garden at the front of the, the big hall. So zooming back out, the actual Grisdale Hall was here. And you can see it in the film, look out for this balustraded wall. Uh, because you see some of the prisoners are actually sitting on that wall, discussing the war and their incarceration. Very, very interesting. Anyway, we digress. So, back to the story. We'll just zoom out a little bit in your own time, Mr. Camera. It does have a very slow. Take your time, no rush. And it, and it stops. <sighs> okay, I'm going to come out a bit more. Thank you very much. <coughs> so, they're incarcerated in Grisdale Hall, and then in the movie you see them being taken out for exercise down the lanes towards Hawk's Head and, and all around the area. Um, and I won't, I won't spoil the whole story by telling you what happens, but essentially he's trying to escape. He tries to escape locally in the lakes, and he finally makes it away, and he spends about two days, two, three days on the run, uh, heading west uh, over towards Ulfa Fell, but in the end they have half the army out looking for him, and this is when the British army were back home in the Battle of Britain, um, because obviously they weren't, they'd been thrown out of Dunkirk, so there were plenty of army chaps around. And the soldiers went and found him with the help of the Home Guard. And he was arrested and uh, chucked back in there and then they decided to move him. So they were going to move him to um, another camp at Swanwick. And on his way, um, they obviously uh, went to the station at Derby, local station. And he, um, he got put in this camp at Swanwick. And they managed to actually do almost like the Great Escape. It's very similar to the Great Escape, the, the way these Germans were very... Uh, creative and showed a lot of initiative in finding clever ways to avoid being heard, digging a tunnel out, which they duly did. And he got out um, and he uh, managed to get all the way to the local aerodrome at Hucknall, which is now the Rolls-Royce factory of course. Uh, there is also still a small airfield there. And um, he actually got as far as blagging his way in there, telling them that he was a Dutch pilot because his English was so good, he put on this slightly Dutch accent and he managed to um, convince them that he sh should be flown back immediately to Dice in Scotland saying he'd been in a Wellington that had crashed. Absolutely incredible tale, I mean spinning so many yarns and yet it's quite convincing and it's the way he did it and the way that he made it sound like it's all very urgent, he's got to get back to his base. And of course there were a lot of pilots from the Dutch Air Force and the Czech Air Force and all these Polish and all these other countries that were uh, assisting to support the Allies. And therefore there were lots of foreigners and uh, it was easy to get confused with whether he was, you know, what, what nationality was he really. Anyway, long story short, um, the station commander was perhaps in the film, I've got to say this, well, I'll, I'll talk about the overall impression of the film in a moment before we come to the model. But in the film, um, it comes across as though the, the British sort of security people were a bit slow, and I think it's perhaps a bit, it's perhaps exaggerated a little bit. But anyway, they, they weren't too slow. They finally did some checks and made some phone calls and realised that there was no such guy and there was no such secret mission that he was on and he didn't have, he hadn't crashed to Wellington, there was no reports of a crash, etc. And they realised that something, well, in the meantime, he jumped through the toilet window and legged it across the airfield to a hurricane that was waiting. <laughs> Uh, and he, he insisted that they uh, started it when he was supposed to be doing a test flight. 
and again he gets thwarted slightly and he has to go and do some paperwork and they insist he fills in this uh, this uh, visitor's book for anybody that's taking one of these flights and he's just that he gets in the actually into the cockpit behind the controls of the aircraft and he's seconds away from starting it up and then the station commander comes and with a revolver and tells it and points the revolver at his head and says get out <laughs> and he's captured again uh, and anyway I won't tell you the rest of the story because it would kind of spoil it but of course in the end he does get away and he, he gets away via Canada and he gets into the United States and people forget of course that the United States was not in the war and was neutral at this time so this is late 1940 uh, and he manages to cross from Canada into the USA uh, having jumped out of a train window uh, and then finally makes all his way down right to the bottom of South America and then goes via Spain and gets back to Germany and it's an absolutely incredible story. Anyway, I recommend you watch the film or read the book. The, the one that got away is actually a book and made into a film. Um, it's, I've got the Daily Mail one here but uh, you can actually get it on YouTube. You can watch it straight after you watch this. I will leave you a link underneath and you can enjoy the film straight away. And uh, actually the quality of that one that's on YouTube is really excellent so if anything it's better than the DVD so you'd enjoy that. Anyway, moving on. The other part of the video isn't just to talk about Volnera but it's to talk about the, the model that Airfix released about this because it's Battle of Britain anniversary year. So we were thought that we would have a little bit of a celebration and maybe have a little talk about some Battle of Britain memorabilia and interesting things. So I'll get my very very slow focus to come in and <laughs> zoom in for you. And this is Von Vera being shot down in Marden in Kent by the Spitfires. And uh, it's quite an interesting bit of data at the top. Let's just have a read of this. You can see it says. There we go. On the 5th of September 1940. I've zoomed in too much now, haven't I? 5th of September 1940. Von Vera is. Messi Smith is crash landed in a field in Kent, is damaged by Spitfires, and famously became the only German prisoner of war of World War II to escape back to Germany and continue fighting. Uh, now, I read that actually that's not strictly true. There was one other German uh, U boat uh, officer that I think escaped by getting jumping on a Spanish boat. But anyway, we won't get into that here. We won't get into that here. So, if you would indulge me, I will now give you a review of the Airfix Von Vera Messerschmitt 109E, uh, E3 stroke E4, and it's in the Von Vera colours. So, what I think we'll do, enough of me uh, yapping away, we'll, we'll go straight into zooming in and I'll get into the box and you can have a good old look at this. So I'll, um, I'll cut myself out of this a little bit, I think, and we will have a nice look at this. Now, first thing to say is the box art. Superb, as is a lot of modern airfix. Really, really nice. It gives you three options as well. Uh, we've got who we got it for. We can have a choice of uh, Von Vera, obviously, the famous escapee. And we've also got Josef Pips Prips Priller. Now, Prips Priller is also a famous car. He's the second of these, uh, the one with the yellow nose here. Uh, Prilla was the guy that was featured in the film The Longest Day, who um, is the only German plane on D-Day to sort of straff. It's not strictly true, but he was certainly the one that um, was well known to be uh, straffing the British and the Canadians on the beaches, uh, the eastern end of the invasion uh, beach landings. And he was a bit another bit of a character, and uh, they sort of have him as almost like a comedic character in the The Longest Day movie. Uh, and then also there's... Um, the Yugoslav option as well, which is based in Belgrade. So, let's have a look at the kit. Now, I have, I have actually opened this just to have a quick check on it. Um, so, you will note that the bags have been opened. But let's have a look at what we've got. So, let's have a little look now. Typical modern airfix instructions. Nice and light and nice decent sheets. Then we've got, I think it's got a, oh yes, it's got, it gives you the option on the back, it's got Von Vera's aircraft depicted. And then there's a second sheet with the other two options. So we've got this Yugoslav Belgrade based aircraft I mentioned earlier, or Pips Prilla, the, uh, 
the long comedian in the longest day who um his last two measure smiths but obviously this is in 1940 so this is actually in france so he was obviously he, he sounds like he lasted most of the war i don't know pips is maybe we'll do a, a program on pips prilla uh pips i keep on pips i get this wrong pips prilla that's it maybe we'll do a program on him because he's got a character as well worthy, worthy of uh, some uh, some study i think so that's a nice scheme actually i've got to say it's got everything it's got like mottled quite an unusual scheme it's got mottled blue and Dunkel Grau, and then it's got little spots of green in there. It's quite, even for 109, that's quite a, a vivid scheme. Anyway, then we have got, then we've got the decals. Now this is where, this is where we hit the first problem with this kit, I think. And it's not just this one in fairness, this is a, a thing that Airfix have been doing for a little while now, which I think is quite annoying. The Cartograph Italian decals are beautiful. There's nothing wrong with them. They're at superb quality. You're not going to have any problems with these at all. But the one problem you will have is that Airfix seem to have insisted on removing the um, swastikas. Now, this is controversial, I know. Um, nobody wants to be bigging up or paying any sort of homage to the Nazi regime. Uh, I'm sure that that's a, a very widely held sentiment wherever you go. But that doesn't mean that you can uh, supposedly you know, produce scale models of a historic event and then actually airbrush history, which is what they're doing. They, they do this a lot. Now, there are countries where it's illegal to show the swastika, which I've got my own views on, but we won't get into that. Which, but I respect that, and I'm sure most people do. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have the aircraft depicted as it was actually appearing on the day in 1940 and throughout the war. Now, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, yes, you don't, people don't want to be offended and all the rest of it, but you can't revise history and delete things just because they're not acceptable, uh, considered evil and all the rest of it, which may all be true, but it, it's still a reality. And I don't like this idea that people airbrush things out because it's no longer considered acceptable. That is, that is literally revising history and it's not nice and I think it's totally false. There is a way around this. There's two ways around it, two options. Either you have a, a UK uh, market version which has the original ones on and other countries too, like maybe the USA where there's not this um, such strong feeling about it. Uh, or better still, do what Tamiyar do. I mean, they did it with the um, the 109G6 that I just built a few weeks ago. They have a swastika, but it's split into parts so that it doesn't appear as a swastika until you make it a swastika, which is your choice. So there's nobody going to get offended by that, and it isn't shown on the box art. Again, I don't really agree with that, but I respect it. But there has to be a sort of a compromise where you can actually build the kit to look as the actual authentic aircraft looked. And I think it's perhaps been taken a bit too far. So Airfix, disappointed in you on that one. I think you, you need to stop that. And they're having the Battle of Britain anniversary. There's going to be lots of reissues around that. I hope they're not going to do this a lot because I think it's just wrong. Yeah, And it's, it's, it's true of any of the World War II Nazi stuff. You know, We don't want to big up the Nazis, of course not. But you can't just pretend it didn't happen. You can't just pretend that these... That's the worst kind of lie, is pretending something didn't happen or it wasn't there. And I, I think that's wrong. Anyway, we move on. So, apart from that, the decals are lovely. <laughs> so let's have a look at the old instructions. And here we go, and it's, uh, it's a typical, <laughs> typical thing with Airfix. I'll zoom you back in nice and close this time. There we go. So we've got the, the typical recent style from Airfix. So we've got uh, some nice detail, actually. Um, good interior to look of it. Plenty of detail. You've got the trim wheels and gun sights, stick. And then the, uh, okay, we've got what looks like the, the comedy pilot, obviously one of the Airfix staff. Um, he's doing a lot of smiling, isn't he, for somebody in the Battle of Britain. He looks like a very cheerful guy to work with, or for. Yeah, I'm not sure it's um, Von Vera, but anyway. <laughs> we move on. Then, we've got the propeller. And we've got the, some of the details like the uh, oxygen canister in the cockpit. Bringing apparatus, and it's got a bit of a detailed engine as well. Now, I'm not sure about this, if I'm honest, because it's this is not going to compete with the sort of Tamiya quality of, or, or Edouard uh, that we're used to recently, and it's not got anything else to actually enhance that detail. I'm not sure what the point of having that is, because it's not proper detail, it's just 
a nod. I think it'd be better if it wasn't there. Or they went the whole hog or did some, you know, some option. Anyway, and it's got the engine support braces, you know. Uh, why? What's the point of that? I'm not sure. Anyway, it all looks like it fits together in a very logical way. I am reliably told this is actually a nice kit to build and has got no great nasties to worry about. Oh, looks very sensible. Oh, yeah. And we've got those uh, 90 degree, uh, about 45 degrees, 45 in, in truth, the, uh, the supports under the tailplanes so that's unique to the 109E, which they drop later, of course. Uh, as we saw in the Tamiya kit, of course, the later G6 doesn't have any of that stuff, so they strengthen it up. But um, then you've got all these uh, options with flats and slats, and they look really nice, I've got to say. They do look uh, very into the Tamiya RS, the way they've gone about it. Yeah, that looks cool. And then you've got options about the degrees. You can you can have the fixed, aren't they, these um, ailerons, but you can have them at varying angles. The choice is yours, but you then glue them in. And then you've got your cannons and your tailplane, which for stabilising. And undercarriage. Uh, not sure how easy it is to get those undercarriage angles right, say in 50, what, 15 degrees. Anybody that's built a 109 before will know that this is... The nightmare job on the 109 is getting those uh, undercarriage legs right. <laughs> or you can have them up, you can have them down, and it's got weight on wheels, which is cool. It's very good. Yeah, weight on wheels here, look. That's nice. Yeah, that's a good addition. And then some, uh, for the finishing off of the canopy, and the canopy always opens on a 109 to the right. I mentioned that because in the one that got the way film, for some reason, they have it opening to the left, which I can assure you ain't right. <laughs> so there's a bit of a glitch there. Somebody, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they reversed the camera or something. I don't know what they did, but they got it wrong. It looks uh, completely incorrect on that DVD anyway. And then finally, we've got the uh, typical Battle of Britain sort of Luftwaffe camo scheme with the, the Dunkel Grau and the, uh, the dark black green and the sky underneath. Excellent. So, let's have a look at what the actual kit is like. Clear parts. Mm, yeah, looks good. Looks okay to me. You've got an option. There's actually two. There's obviously a later. Uh, it's a shared sprue with something else for a different version uh, because it's got one that's got no division uh, framing on the central opening canopy. Uh, let me go see that here on the feed. Oops. Let's get it in here. Talking about this one here. Whereas that would be the correct one for the Battle of Britain. That's obviously a later one. Uh, but anyway, it looks nice. It looks very clear. That's the fault with that. That's great. Right, let's have a look at the old. Let's get digging into the, the main sprues. Right. So, what have we got? Over there for a second, and let's have a proper look. Bring you in a tad closer. Hmm. Okay. Wow. Nice engine cover. Uh, yeah, the parts are um, they're nicely moulded. Uh, I would say this. I'll zoom in more so you can you know, know what I'm going to talk about now. What I would say though is that there's a horrendous amount of flash and it's on some of the parts as you can see. Um, this has been talked about a lot by lots of well-known people. Interestingly, uh, most of the experts seem to think that it's to do with the plastic. The plastic that Airfix use, and I think this is their Indian production, I'm pretty confident it is. You can tell by the plastic it's going to have. Um, it's very soft and it's a bit like the Revell. They've got the same issue actually and they also tend to have lots and lots of flash. Now some of the parts are better than others so I think there's a bit of a tooling issue here as well to be quite honest with you. I mean don't forget I am spoiled. I've just made the Tamiya 109G6 and it was absolutely superb. There was no flash. The end. Okay, <laughs> simple as that really. 
Um, it was perfect, but there's a lot of flash going on here. Look at these parts here. I mean, you know, it's filling up the gaps. Now either that's that's it's too soft when it's coming out of the mould, or the plastic is just too soft and and or there's a turling problem. Um, hmm. It's not. I've seen worse, but it's not. It's not that. It doesn't look that modern. What's the story here? Does it need to tell? Me? It tells you something. Where is it? Bear with me a moment. Ah, here we go. Model design and tooling is 2010, and the decal schemes and the pack design are 2018, made in India. Well, there you go, that just tells you in that first two sentences everything you need to know. So, yeah, I was right, it's made in India, it's very soft plastic, and, and when you put it down on the table, as everybody always says, you can tell again because you put it down and it's just very, very soft, and it's that. It's sort of boing, boing, boing. And you do that with Tamiya and it's like ksh, it's very crisp sound. Anyway, I mean look at this here. That, uh, let's bring in again. So here we've got an entire piece that's just flash. That's not a part. It's not a component, that is just a piece of flash. So it's a bit nasty. Um anyway. Uh, yeah. It's disappointing that. I think that's 2010, isn't it? I, I suppose that I didn't realise, if I'm honest, I thought this was about two or three years old and it's actually 10. So that, that would explain it. But let's put that aside. It's very flashy. In terms of the quality of the moulding, I mean, there's, a, so there's some nice stuff here. There's, uh, the seat belts are actually, for example, moulded into the seat. Can we see that? Here we go. You can see there. That's nicely done. That's very good. Instead of having like a decal like Tammy do, which is really naff, to be honest. That's one thing I don't like about their offering. Um, and it's got the weight on wheels. You can see that there. I can just get it in for you. There we go. That's quite nice. And very nicely moulded. Crisp. Yeah, and they just need to get the tooling better and, and get rid of this soft plastic. Now, I've got to be honest, I've seen some of their new stuff. Uh, what's the like that? The Hunter or the Phantom. They're better, much better than this. Anyway, let's move on to the other sprue. So here we have. Sorry, it's going to cause a spoke. Here we have the main fuselage and wings. And I've got to be honest with you that this looks much, much better. Infinitely better. In fact, I can't really see any flash on that at all. It's almost like these two were made by two different companies. Just the plastic. Is, I'm just bear with me. I'm just comparing plastic itself. Uh, it does look the same. I thought it was a different colour, but I don't think it is. Maybe it's just a better tool. Uh, that could just explain it, really. So. We've got some really, really great detail here. Look at this. Yeah, that's nice. This is more like it, and you can see this um, this engine detail that I spoke of. Yeah, I don't know why they did that though, because they've made you know they've made the basic outline of an engine with minimal detail and nothing else, nothing else to support the detail. It's just an engine block basically, and then the two support um, uh, sort of girders, if you like, the uh, the engine mountings. No, that's crazy. That, I'm not going to share that. I, I think it'd be crazy to try and start trying to display it in the way you did with the Tamiya one, which was beautiful, of course, and had every component pretty much on, on show, apart from the, the fine wiring harnesses. But um, anyway, no, we just ignore that. You just cover it up and, and show it as a an ME109 with its uh, engine covers on. Now this is nice. These are nice. Very finely moulded. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So it's a bit of a mixture, isn't it, really? I would say that if, if both the sprues were as good as this one, I'd be chuffed to bits of it. Um, but one is a bit weak uh, and you're going to be cleaning up quite a bit of flash on here. 
Sunflowers have got more than others. It seems to be more the ones near the centre of the sprue, actually. The further out they are, the better they are. And the closer into the centre line, those are the ones that have got the problems. Hmm. So, well, there we go. So there's not, not a lot to it, obviously, in terms of uh, components. I have to say, I love the... I love the colour uh, that comes with it. I think that's really nice. It's very well done. I think the instructions are fine. Very nice as well. Again, little data on the back. Um, hmm. Interesting. All in all, looks quite decent. I think maybe I'm being too harsh about the uh, about the flash, but you've got to remember, I've just I've just built the Tamiya. Now the Tamiya is more expensive. It cost thirty-four pound, thirty-five pound. This costs 25, I think it was, 25, 26 thereabouts. So yeah, the Tamiya is dearer, but you know, uh, yeah, I think this is the danger. This is what this is what they do, isn't it? Airfix and Revell do this. They rebox things, they play trickery, new artwork, new decals. You think you're getting a new kit, and then you find out it's actually built 10 years ago. Um, there's certainly nothing wrong with that sprue, that's nice. And the, to be honest, the clear parts look nice as well. But that looks like it's 10 years old and a bit disappointing to me. You know, we just reviewed the Revel reboxing, uh, one of my previous uh, reviews, uh, the reboxing of the Fox Baton MiG 25 uh, RBT, and that was fantastic. No, no flash, no problems. Okay. Uh, people that have built this though tell me it goes together really nicely, so perhaps just, you know, knuckle down and clean up all the flash. Well, there we go. So, yeah, nice kit. Um, I've got to say that the artwork is probably the best thing about it of all. <laughs> but it's a great time to be building um, a Battle of Britain uh, Mission at 109. Now, I did say in my Indiana Jones videos uh, <laughs> that I was going to build the 109 132nd scale. I'm kind of having second thoughts, which is one of the reasons I bought this. I've only had this for two days. Um, I've had second thoughts about that because I'm thinking that, to be honest, uh, those matchbox kits, you know, as was the theme of the uh, the Lost Ark, they're quite rare. And I'm th I'm thinking, do I really need to build a 132nd scale and take that out of the market and and reduce my stock? And I'm a bit short of space, so I think I'll build this. Uh, so I'll have to shut up and just get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there we go. I think it'd be a good kit. Um, just requires a bit of work, obviously. Well, there we go. So, uh, are we also building to go with that, of course, our um, our friendly uh, Tamiya 148th to match it, uh, Spitfire Mark 1. And we could perhaps have a little dogfight, you know. Now, that's the one that's going to be, excuse me, <clears throat> in the colours of the Phantom Flyer. And we'll talk more about the Phantom Flyer in a later uh, instalment where I'll explain what all that's about and we'll have the kit out and we'll talk about another legend of the Battle of Britain. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the uh, the talk about the film. Uh, I'd strongly recommend you go, go and get the film. I say you don't need to buy it because I'm going to give you the link and you'll be able to watch it straight away and I think you'll find it a really enjoyable film. It's about an hour and 46 minutes long, so it's not too long. And uh, it's a remarkable story. I mean, I will just say this about the, um, the movie in summary. Um, Hardy Kruger plays Von Vera, and he kind of grates, uh, certainly did with me, he grated a little bit. You think, what a cocky, annoying, arrogant, just shoot him, you know. <laughs> it was the war. But actually, as the film wears on, you become more and more sympathetic to him because he's just so brave and he doesn't use any violence to try and get out. He's very cunning and clever uh, and it reminds you of The Great Escape more and more and uh, I've never seen the film before, I knew of it, but it does, it came across to me uh, very much like The Great Escape and I quite admired him at the end I thought, you know, he was absolutely hell-bent on getting back and sadly it doesn't have a very happy ending, uh, I won't spoil it, but uh, it, it has a happy ending uh, in the movie, but uh, the footnote is a bit of a sad one. So, very interesting character, and uh, in his own way, very heroic 
figure um, like our own guys were as you saw in you know the great escape so it just goes to show that uh, how much you can get through in life with sheer determination and cunning and guile and cleverness you know. anyway uh, there we go um, have a watch of the film I uh, hope you enjoyed the review of the kit I'll get that built hopefully later in the summer we'll have at some point we'll have some uh, completed video footage of the Spitfire and the Messerschmitt together um, and we'll talk about the Phantom Flyer uh, and we've got some other ones coming up great videos coming very soon I hope you'll tune in for those we've got uh, we've got a motor racing related one about Le Mans uh, it's the 50th anniversary of Porsche winning Le Mans and Steve McQueen making the Le Mans movie so that should be quite enjoyable uh, and some insight for you uh, and because I'm building the Porsche 917 kit to go with it so we'll, we'll have that as well later um, so tune in for all those uh, still to come later in the summer and in the meantime stay safe wash your hands try and keep your distance from everybody hope you're going to be healthy and safe and i hope to see you all very very soon thanks a lot and take care for now bye bye